if you could go back in time and like kept all of your knowledge that you have now, what would you mm -hmm. do differently when starting a new team? Well, I think going into this, I had a pretty ambitious goal and I, I approached a couple other guys that I wanted to run the team with. And I said, I want to run a top quality program. Um, so, I mean, philosophically, I went into this, like, I don't want to be using a bunch of hand-me-down guns with mismatched magazines and stuff. And so I started with the help of a nonprofit here in Arizona, and they gave us a couple of guns to get started with. And then like right off the bat, like I wanted to run Ruger Mark IVs. Um, you know, we were running Ruger 1022s. I just, I wanted to run with gear that I knew would be competitive. So we wouldn't essentially grow out of our gear. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have to get something new to replace it with because it wasn't good enough. So, I mean, philosophically, I approach this from a from point of view, like, I want to run a top quality program, but, you know, we didn't go out with this ambition that we're going to, we have this caviar appetite. Um, we didn't try to start with Pardini's and Hammerleys. So we started with, with, I think, the best guns in this program. And I think, you know, looking back on it, I think that was the right approach. So, I mean, every team always struggles with money. I mean, I've never seen a team that said, oh, you know, we have enough, we have enough financial resources. So um, Friends of NRA and uh, Friends of NRA was essential. Um, if I hadn't had their funding the first year, like I wasn't going to start it because I didn't want to start a program that was just going to be constantly on the struggle bus. So they provided us with the seed money. That way, when we started the program from the coach's point of view, we could make it affordable to the kids. And we started out the program the first year they joined for a hundred dollars and then they paid for their own ammo. Um, and I think that, I mean, looking back on it, I think that was really the right approach to have. Um, and then we constantly looked for other resources. Um, you know, we found out about Midway foundation, started putting money into that endowment, which is a, it's a little bit of a tough sell at first because, you don't get instant returns. I mean, it really takes a while to build that account to become something where it becomes a, a substantial part of your expenses. So, um, but I mean, you just have to recognize the value is kind of down the road, you know, two, three, four, five years before you really start to get the benefits of having that endowment account. Yeah. Um, with new coaches, then, would you recommend like start that as quickly as possible that way? Yes. So you've got to have a core uh, group of adults that are kind of running the program. And even the program, we always talk about how it's kind of a three-legged tripod. You have to have, you know, the motivated adults, the kids, and then a place to shoot. And if any one of those, any one of those legs on the tripod is weak, you're going to have a, you're going to struggle. And so, you know, in, in addition to that, you've already mentioned that finances are always a struggle for every team. Um, and th there's no magic pill for that. So it's not like there, there's an easy solution for some of this stuff. You just have to work your way through it. And, you know, as a team, I always, when we set our, when we set our participation fees, it was always based on the idea that, you know, if I've got 10 or 12 kids on the team every year, I can buy one more piece of minor equipment and, and that never ends. I mean, you're always buying paper targets and staples and spray paint and ammo. And, you know, you always want another new gun. And when we joined the program, it seemed like almost every year the program was adding another discipline. Well, it's like, Hey, we really want to shoot 1911 next year. Now we got to buy those guns. And I, right, we really want to shoot PCC. So we got to go buy those guns. And, um, and so that has expanded like almost, I mean, you think of, you look at where we are now, we've got 10 disciplines, you know, we started out with two. And so, you know, you look at how much more equipment a team needs to be able to offer all these opportunities for these kids. Um, and you, you, you've got to have the financial resources because I just, um, you know, I, I don't know. I do know some teams that participate in a lot of different disciplines. And, you know, honestly, those kids have got to come from wealthier families because they've got to, you know, buy six or eight guns for each kid that's participating in this team and all the magazines and stuff that goes with it, all the travel expenses. And um, the thing that I found has been really, I guess, a surprise from my point of view is that 
my youth team, which is grade schoolers, middle schoolers, and high schoolers, um, they've got more guns than the kids on my college team. But then when you kind of look at the logistics of it, a lot of those kids are from out of town. You know, a lot of those kids are under 21. They can't just walk into a gun store and, you know, buy their own pistol. And so there's like these logistics constraints that make it a lot harder for the the college athletes to have guns than, than like my grade schoolers. I mean, you know, dad's obviously into guns and he's really happy to go out and buy his kid a new 1022, you know, for Christmas. So, you know, those, those, uh, those grade schoolers got more guns on my team than my college kids. Right. Yeah. If you're a college kid, I mean, you're sort of an adult. You're on your own with, with shooting. Yeah, you're on your own financially, but then you've also got all these other draws that are sucking money out of your pocket. I mean, oh. beer money and, you know, and all the other <laughs> the activities that college kids like to do that, you know, puts additional restraint on your resources. So Yeah, yeah. So, if, I mean, in that case, if you don't get them young, then, you know, the longevity of, of shooting sports might just be a, a semester long thing, you know? It, it is. And I have, I mean, I'll tell you from my point of view, there's very little overlap. I mean, I've had very few kids that have come out of my straight shooters team and then gone on to be wildcats. I mean, very few in it, you know, a lot of it might be, well, you know, they went out of state to college, they went somewhere else, but uh, even the, even the athletes that I know have stayed in Tucson, oftentimes they just don't become Wildcats, and it's just there's so many choices, and once you start getting into college, and I mean grades become so much of a higher priority, and um, the environment is just so different. So I've got uh, probably four kids that have aged out of straight shooters that have gone on to become Wildcats, um, and that's probably I, I don't even know what the percentage is, but it is. It's a really different demographic group, but that's okay. I mean, even if the program and these teams are offering them you know, a couple of years of team sports. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. And I've had a lot of people even on the, um, especially on my college team where, you know, I can tell they're kind of reluctant. They're not really sure if they want to join. And, you know, I, and I just try to have a conversation with them. And and I will tell you that I think there's a lot of people that, that join Wildcats and they join for a semester or a year. And I tell them right up front, it's like, Hey, if you just want to learn firearm safety, like you don't have to be a competitor. You don't have to go to collegiate nationals. It doesn't have to be an all-consuming, uh, you know, part of your identity. If you just want to learn firearm safety, join the team. Yeah. And after doing this for a semester or a year, you'll have a lot more understanding of about firearms that will hopefully, I think, benefit you the rest of your life. Even if you, even if it doesn't become part of your lifestyle. Yeah. Um, part of that tripod, you know, the home range as, as a regional field rep, what advice do you have for coaches when they're just getting started? Like how to create that relationship with the local range? Yep. So, and yeah, that, that's the key word right there is you have a relationship with them. So, um, you know, I think we all kind of sometimes get sucked up in our own little silos and we get so driven and motivated by you know, this issue. And like, I, you know, I love doing the youth shooting, but we've got to recognize that when we go to that home range where we are, um, we're like one cog and they're a very big machine. You know, they've got, you know, they've got their own financial issues. They've got uh, conflicting range uses. Uh, my home range where my, uh, my youth team is um, allows the range to be used by local law enforcement agencies. So sometimes we get bumped off the range because the law enforcement agency is using the range for training. And you know, you can't be pro-gun and not support the police training on the range. I mean, we want those police to be well trained so yeah. that when they're out in the public environment, they're able to, you know, use the marksmanship that's required to do their job sometimes. So um and so we're kind of one cog in that machine that that is that home range. And you know, I can tell you in the 10 years that straight shooters have been um, at our home range, we've had a incredibly diverse level of support from the club. You know, we've had some club leaders that are like, you know, they believe in it passionately. They understand like this is the future of the shooting sports. We've got to support them. Uh, what, what do you need? And then I've got other, you know, other club leaders that have been um, where we've been an annoyance because we're, we're taking up the range and we're not bringing revenue into the club 
Yeah. And so from a purely business transaction point of view, uh, they just find us to be incredibly inconvenient and they're not, uh, they're not supportive in any way whatsoever. So uh, I'm really happy right now that the pendulum's kind of swung and we're back at the point where um, I think the club, you know, appreciates what we're doing and the message that we're uh, passing on. And, and so, but the, you know, that word that you mentioned earlier, relationships, that's what it's about. So you've got to have a relationship with, you know, and, and so I guess my best advice would be to make sure you've got relationships with two or three or four people at the club, because if you've got a great relationship with one guy and he gets, you know, voted out of office or moves or gets a job transfer, um, you're going to feel the pain. Yeah. So yeah it's important to have a relationship with, with several people on the club and, um, not just in shooting sports, but I think in, in everything in life, we really have to do kind of a better job of telling our own story. You know, someone's not going to come along and say, you know, Tom, tell me more all about what you're doing. I mean, that, that, that's so, such a rare opportunity. And so we've got to do a good job of telling our own story and, and our own successes and, you know, social media as much as um, Instagram hates us. Uh, my team, my, my college team is shadow banned right now. Um, and the, the picture that we got shadow banned for was our public community service project where we were teaching members of the public how to be safe with firearms. And that's the picture that banned us on Instagram is the fact that we dared educate the public on how to be safe with firearms. But, uh, you know, that, that's the struggle we've got. We've got to tell our own story. And yet a lot of the vehicles that we would use to tell that story are uh <laughs> don't want us they want to silence us um in your from your perspective as coach head coach um what does that out that kind of outreach with the community do for your team and then what do you see extrapolated to the community like how does that help um, yeah. those around you so this is where you start to really deal with a lot of intangibles like I can't give you a spreadsheet to say that, you know, how many dollars it's brought in or how many athletes it's brought in or how many, you know, because you a lot of this honestly is is kind of emotional and you can't yeah. measure that always quantitatively. Um, but what I'll tell you is that this is one of the programs that makes the Wildcats stronger as a team. And so what that means is that um, the National Shooting Sports Foundation is a very strong representative of the shooting sports kind of on a, on a, on a national level. I mean, they're active in Congress. They do a lot of things uh, towards legislation and things like that, but they're also very strongly involved in the image of the shooting sports. And so the Wildcats partner with the national shooting sports foundation, and we follow their template for a program called first shots and first shots is specifically geared towards teaching members of the public that are brand new gun owners, how to be safe with their firearm. And so with a record number of firearm sales that have occurred essentially for like the last 10 years now, um, we're always breaking new records on how many firearms have been sold. You know, there's a lot of gun owners out there that have bought, they have bought a gun, but they have no idea. They haven't had any formal training. And so we are kind of that, literally that first step in offering members of the public um, some, some basic training. And it just starts out with, the basics of gun safety and the very basics of marksmanship. And so we're sharing this information with our community, which makes our community safer. And I can't quantify that other than to tell you that we are um, somewhere between 700 and 900 members of the community that have been through our program. Mm -hmm. And that's a tangible number of people. So, you know, we've been doing this for six years now. Um, and so the Wildcats come in and my athletes, my coaches, my coach athletes, we run the first shots program. And then we take our firearms to the range. We let the public shoot them. The National Shooting Sports Foundation provides ammo to us. So that's part of their outreach to the public. The Pima County Community Range, they get to essentially use us as a resource to, again, promote their mission of providing services to the public. And so we're a good partner for the range. So, you know, the message behind all of this is this isn't a one-way street. 
we get to use that facility in an exchange. And it's not a quid pro quo, but this is what makes us a good partner is that we then come along and twice a year we run a uh, first shots program, which is teaching gun safety to the members of the public. And then Pima County uses their resources um, through their Facebook page, through their direct emails. And then they use their uh, community service people to reach out to the local news agencies and say, hey, we're running a program out here. And so typically before we do a first shots, we're on one of the local TV stations saying, hey, if you're interested in learning about basic gun safety, come out to Pima County range on this date. And uh, and then they come out and they see, you know, 15 or 25 wildcats in uniform that are running this program. And again, that's just, it's raising awareness. This is what I talk about, about raising the, you know, waving your own flag. This is kind of our opportunity to wave the flag and say, you know, we're very much interested in community safety and education. And here's what we're going to share with you. Is that a, um, for teams that are hearing this and interested in it, is that a concerted effort during National Shooting Sports Month, or can they do that anytime they want with the NSSF's support? So we, so August is National Shooting Sports Month. So NSSF will send us flyers and iPro and EarPro and ammo and targets and little keychain doodads and stickers, uh, gun safety books, trigger locks. I mean, just a whole accoutrement. I mean, I get um, two or three very large boxes of stuff that we use <clears throat> for that National Shooting Sports Month. And that's something that NSSF has budgeted for every year for August. We hand out as much of it as we have people, but then when we have another one in January, we're gonna take all of our leftovers and we're going to share it all again in January. So typically NSSF doesn't send us as much in January because that's not National Shooting Sports Month. But, um, you know, if they, if they send us enough materials, um, you know, for, for 200 people and we only have 150 people attend, we've still got some materials that we're going to share with people in January. And so we, we kind of... Um, you know, we kind of space it out because we want everybody to get something out of it. And then honestly, people show up and attend these events and they don't always take the literature. So rather than sweep that thing into the trash can, we're going to save and gobble it all back up. And then we're going to, we're going to put it back out there in January again. So we can generally get, um, everybody will get something when they come to our program. And it doesn't matter if it's in August or in January, mm -hmm. um, they'll get something. And if they want to get trigger locks, take a trigger lock. But a lot of people, they don't take them. So we're going to keep, putting them out, you know, event after event until, um, you know, people take the the material that they want. I've got like a five page little brochure on like how we do it. And mm -hmm. I'm happy to like send that to you. And it's just yeah. kind of a little, um, you know, it gives people an idea like, you know, if we're going to run a check-in, okay, I want two people to register and we're going to do a PowerPoint program from NSSF where we're going to kind of walk them through the basic fundamentals of gun safety. Okay. That just takes one person. And then we're going to send to another station. We're going to teach them sight alignment, trigger control, grip, and stance. And like, I want four people over there. And then we have a CERT gun, which is a non-firing, non-firearm replica that does a good job that we can use with training so that if somebody loses that self-awareness, that sense of muzzle control, nobody's in danger. So it's a good opportunity for them to learn, yeah. and, but we're still creating a safe environment for them to do it if they do make a mistake. And so, you know, I want four people over there. And so I kind of walk it down. It's a little outline of how, how we do it, but we don't do it the way NSSF recommends. Um, so, I mean, you know, my point is there's, there's many right ways to do this. So circling back to your teams, plural, uh, has, have they always been action focused or you had international shooting in mind when you started it? Well, we started out purely as action. Um, and then probably three or four years into it. Um, well, let me rephrase that. So we started out purely as action. I think that was 2012. In 2014, um, the Scholastic Pistol Program actually had an event at the Olympic Training Center. We had our very first Olympic training camp. And so that was just barely two years into when we had been running an action team. So right around 2014, after this exposure at the Olympic Training Camp, talking about the Olympics, um, we kind of slowly started acquiring some of the right equipment to be able to offer that. And uh, 
it's really kind of an aspirational event. I mean, we weren't we weren't going to the Junior Olympics. We weren't we weren't doing a lot of these things, but we just kind of give kids a taste of some of the shooting sports opportunities that are out in front of them. And then probably I'm going to say about 20, I don't know, 2016 or something, we started to get a little more serious about it. And we're at the point today where we've got probably 10 Olympic air pistol team guns and we've got five electronic targets hung on the wall thanks to Midway Foundation. And uh, I've sent, straight shooters have sent, um, have had six kids selected to go to Junior Olympics. Um, I've sent four kids to Junior Olympics. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we are, we are serious about it now, but as a percentage, it's probably only maybe a quarter of the action shooters that want to do Olympic stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there any difficulties that arise having a, a team that has their foot in both camps, so to speak? Yeah, I think the biggest issue is just the coaches have to have the time. Um, so, I mean, one is the coaches have to have the time. And the second issue is there's almost zero overlap. Um, well, that's not quite true. I'd say there's probably only 20% overlap in terms of equipment. So, I mean, all the fundraising and the resource and the, the, the events that you've run to raise money to buy equipment um, for action shooting mostly doesn't apply to international stuff. So um, I think from, you know, you talk about what would you do different, what I would definitely do different um, knowing what I know now is I would have focused more on sport pistol. So you can take your Ruger Mark IV and shoot action with it and take that exact same firearm, exact same magazine, exact same ammo and go over and shoot sport pistol with it without any additional equipment constraints. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I did it. <laughs> so we have two completely different sets of equipment because we got air pistols and we've got action shooting pistols. Um, so that was, those were decisions that we made early on that were probably more difficult than, than the, what I'm suggesting is do, do sport pistols, sport pistols, a natural, a more natural fit for, um, for a team that al is already action shooters. Yeah, and that's the big reason why at College Nationals slash Talladega Regional, there was that um, kind of blend between sport pistol and I forget what the two sports, it w it wasn't straight sport pistol, but gave... Yeah, it's a half and half. Yeah. Yeah, gave, sport pistol and rapid fire. Right, that's what it was. Yep. Yeah. So it gave those action shooting kids something that made a little more sense to them, but still gave them exposure to... An Olympic discipline. Yep, definitely. And the same oh. things that make a good action pistol also make it a good sport pistol. I mean, in the sense that you need good sights and a good trigger. And if your gun's got good sights and a good trigger on it, well, that that's a gun that's absolutely a good start to do sport pistol. For sport pistol, is that something that you can easily, you know, this is talking to the new coach, right? Who's mm -hmm who's not familiar with it. Is that something you can do easily set up at your current home range that's kind of focused towards action shooting? Yeah, absolutely. And and the way I would suggest starting it is um, sport pistol and, and rapid fire are both 25 meter. And so the easiest way to, to adapt to it to a action shooting team is to buy reduced targets. So you can buy a paper targets that have reduced in size that's designed to be shot at, you know, 10 yards or 15 yards or something like that. And then it, it just it just becomes a it just becomes another thing to shoot while you're at action shooting practice. Now, if you really want to be serious about it, okay, now we got to talk about your stance is a little different, you're shooting it one-handed. But for a lot of kids that are just want to get a taste for it, let them shoot it two-handed. You know, and just just let them shoot it for groups, find out how good they are. And then you're going to have a couple of kids that are really going to shine at this. And then you have a conversation with them. Hey, if you're interested, if you're really doing well at this, you know, you might want to consider doing it this way at the next practice and then have them try shooting it one handed. And um, 
then I mean, you're off to the races. But from the equipment point of view, it's it's easy. It's just you know finding the right kid that's the right fit for doing it. Back to resources with with ammo's ammo prices being higher than we all remember and probably not ever coming back down again. Um, what does your team, what do you have your team do to kind of maximize dry fire versus live fire? So we have, the team has a couple of cert pistols and each one of those cert pistols has a Mantis X10. And cert and Mantis are both sponsors of our program. So we get special deals on that stuff. And so one of the things I've encouraged my kids to do is they can check this out from me and uh, take it home. And the thing that I think is really, uh, I learned this from uh, Elliot Jardines. Um, the thing that's really sneaky about it is that you have them log in and they join the Mantis <laughs> team. So now, guess what, coach? Yep. You get to see when they're practicing. <laughs> so if they show up to the next practice and they tell you they've been practicing, you can really easily open the app and see how many trigger presses they've got since the last <laughs> practice. So um, there's kind of there's got to be a checks and balances in there. And then this is a really great way to, to kind of use that checks and balances to say, well, really, how much did you practice? And uh, so the, that Mantis is really a great way because um when, when I'm coaching somebody that's brand new, one of the things I always tell them is that like you've essentially known how to aim ever since you were like two years old and you pointed up at the, at the kitchen counter and you said, mama cookie. Like, and you pointed up on the counter with your finger. Like you were aiming back then, like mama cookie, you're pointing to that cookie jar. So when you're two years old, you're already knowing how to aim. And so now in order to make these athletes better and better and better, what it comes down to is teach them trigger pull. Teaching somebody how to aim is easy. I mean, that's an easy thing to do. Teaching them how to really execute a good trigger pull, that's where the challenge is. That's what's hard. Right. And even the best athletes in the world, it's rarely because the shot wasn't well aimed. It's almost always because the shot wasn't well fired. And that comes down to trigger pull. And the Manus is, is an absolutely fabulous tool for, um, for doing that. And one of the reasons why it's so great is because it's ruthless. It's completely objective. It doesn't care how you felt about that trigger pull. It's going to tell you like that was great or that was terrible or, you know, something in the middle. And so that Manus is a fabulous tool for that because uh, it is, it's ruthless. It'll tell you exactly what you did. Yeah. And so when you're doing dry fire, and this is one of those things that like every, every single cop of shooter you'll ever talk to, will talk to you about the importance of dry fire and how valuable it is and how much you can learn from it. And nobody wants to do it. No action shooting kid on the planet wants to like, like, I really want to go dry fire today. Like it just, it just never happens. And, um, and so this mantis is kind of a way where it turns it more into a game uh, it gives you honest feedback. You can't lie to yourself. You can try, right? <laughs> but it's going to tell you the truth, regardless if you want to hear it or not. And so that's one of the reasons it makes it a good training tool. Are there any prompts that you use as a coach to get a little more performance or just change the mindset of how your kids are seeing things? Because looking back, yeah. I would be like, I would think, oh, I... I don't wish I went faster. I wish I would have just gotten more hits instead yeah. of, you know, I never look back and go, oh, yeah, I wish I would have gone faster. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So there's a couple of things I really like doing. Um, and th this is this is a constant struggle with people because I think a lot of shooters, um, part of their identity is being a shooter. And part of what gets in their way is their own ego. You know, they want to be great. They want to be the best. They want to be the fastest. Um, so one of my quotes is I love from Rob Latham is that you have to hate missing more than you hate going slow. And, you know, when it comes down to it, like the guy that hits the most is is going to be on the top of the podium. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm talking among fast shooters. Yeah. Um, so we had a young man named Dylan Richmond years ago and when I first went to nationals, I would really kind of, I was really watching what Dylan would do. And I asked Dylan at the end of the match, it was like, he won the national championship that year, HOA for male. 
And I says, uh, how many rounds did you fire? And he says, well, I fired 104, but I made up two hits. So he fired 104 rounds. A perfect match is 100 shots. He fired 104, but he fired two more than he needed to because he wasn't sure that he mm-hmm. hit it. So mm-hmm. he wanted to take the insurance shot on it rather than risk getting a three-second penalty. So realistically, he had two extra shots that year. And um, this is a really, really hard point to sell because as human beings, we are not very good at perceiving time when we're under pressure. And we've all done this where we've like we've been taking a test. And all of a sudden you look up at the clock and you're like, what? I only have 15 minutes left. Like when you're under the pressure of taking that test, you don't realize how much time you're, you're taking. And so one of my athletes on the Wildcats uh, a year and a half ago, we came back from collegiate nationals and he's always been a solid shooter. And at the very end, I'm looking at my performance score sheet and I look over and I'm like, Nate, you fired a perfect match. You fired a hundred shots. And I'd never, ever seen that in a national competition. And I'm flipping over my other score sheets to everybody else on the team. And I'm like, Nate, you were the fastest wildcat on the team. So it's easy to shoot 100 for 100. Like almost any intermediate shooter can do that if they want to. But their match time is going to be like 200 seconds or something. Right? But he was the fastest guy on the team. And he shot 100 for 100. So, I mean, that is a level of discipline. Mm-hmm. That is, is it's first of all, it's really rare, but he was one of these just super amazing people that he had a, um, he had a double major and a master's when he graduated. I mean, he was just one of those incredibly driven individuals. And so, um, yeah, it was super inspiring, but, you know, kind of getting back to your talk about or your question about, you know, how do you get them to want to hit more or miss less? One of the things I really like doing is I'll set up a stage with nine targets. So you're essentially allowed to have a miss and it's not going to hurt you a whole lot. If you have two misses and have to do a reload, what's your string time going to be? If you have to Mm -hmm. reload, I mean, that is, that's punishing. Like if you had to, I mean, reload two, three seconds, maybe, you know, when you're grabbing a magazine off of a table and trying to do a reload. So, so I like doing all set up stages where we'll set up nine targets. And the other thing is that um, that is really fun to do is if you pair up athletes, and have them do a dueling tree Um, because one of the things we talk about is every time you miss he just got one target ahead Mm -hmm. you just gave it to him you just gave him a free target every time you miss he got a target ahead and then i'll have another set of kids standing behind those on the dueling tree and i'm like hey your job is just see how many misses he has just just count them see how many misses he's got now when they step up into the box and it's their turn they realize how expensive a miss is. Yeah. And so I think that's fun. And then whenever you're dealing with like dueling trees and stuff, um, dueling trees are way more personal. If you're shooting against a timer, like, oh, okay, I shot a 2.3, I shot a 2.4, okay, that was cool. I shot a 2.1 that time, that was pretty good. You know, but all of a sudden you're shooting against another human being and you see their steel target swing over as you're shooting yours, that's really personal. So it's, it's motivating. I mean, it's just like, it gets your adrenaline going and like, I can't let them get away with this. <laughs> and so you're really like personally motivated to like, you know, okay, I gotta get this guy. So, so I think dueling trees are really good from uh, a way to easily replicate a competition environment um and then like setting out nine targets um and then the super easy thing to do is like if you're on a range where i can't set up nine targets whatever super easy thing is i'll just tell people we're shooting virginia count today Hmm. right and so if you're a uspsa shooter you know what that means but uh, you put five mags in your five round you know in your gun because you're only allowed five shots so um and then all of a sudden if they miss nope you're out off the line next shooter come on up you're like whoa whoa whoa! i'm not done yes you are you're out so you know again i'm and what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to recreate a pressure environment um so that when they go to nationals the pressure doesn't isn't overwhelming it's different you can't replicate it it's going to be different but they've already know what pressure feels like they already know like 
you know, hey, coach is mean. He's kicking me out. Of the, I only got to fire one string and he kicked me out. Like, you know, so I mean, they, they've kind of already experienced some of that, um, that, you know, that, that, that performance pressure. Like you're either going to shoot a clean run or I'm kicking you out. So it's up to you. Who's in control of this? You are. Yep. You're in control. So, you know, if you got kicked out, it wasn't my fault. It was, you know. So there's little things you can do. And then, you know, a lot of little things. Um, one of my coaches loves to set up like mini trap. So instead of, you know, 10s and 12s and an 18 by 24 at the bottom, he'll set up 8s and 10s and a 12 by 18. Yeah, everything's tiny. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? And, you know, you shoot, you shoot in and out. Instead of shooting 10s and 12s, we'll set up 8s and 10s. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just little things like that, that like, and what am I forcing you to do? Like, well, by doing that, I'm forcing you to put more emphasis on sight alignment. You have to be patient. You have to be visually patient. You got to get that sight alignment, press that trigger uh, because they're, they're harder targets. Yeah. So, what, what is the feedback men on the, the new stage pop quiz? Uh, I have got three of my kids that have specifically requested it over and over. Uh-uh. Now, um, what I will tell you is we set it up for the state match. Um, so let me back up a little bit in history. Every one of these stages, when Paul Dandini designed the first four stages, he designed these stages. Each one is designed to challenge something about the shooter and and their their fundamentals. And so I always look at these as these stages are essentially an opportunity to fix a problem with fundamentals. And so the very first year the Wildcats were shooting, I had a young man on my team and I was really struggling as a coach to connect with him to, and I I use a baseball analogy. You, you, You play baseball, you know, baseball coach will say, you know, you've got a hole in your swing. You know, you can't hit the slider. You can't hit the inside fastball or you can't hit the curveball, or you've got a hole in your swing. And all of these stages are kind of designed to reveal these weaknesses in your shooting ability. And so um, really early on, we developed, we, we shoot like 14 stages. So there's regulation stages, and then there's all of our stages that we like to shoot. And they're each designed to show a weakness in your shooting style. And so we invented this stage. And so, you know, lo and behold, like six years later, Rick's like, hey, what's that stage that you posted on Instagram? I'm like, oh, that's called Pop Quiz. He goes, where'd you get that name? He goes, well, one of my coaches named it because if you've ever seen the Keanu Reeves movie Speed, there's this interaction between Dennis Hopper and Keanu Reeves. And like, hey, you know, Pop Quiz A something, you know, keep it G-rated. You know, Dennis Hopper asked some Pop Quiz. So that's what we named our stage. So because there's a target you can't shoot, like right in the middle. So that's kind of where it relates to the movie speed. But but anyway, so we started shooting this. And so when we shot the state match, the thing that was absolutely fascinating to me is my rookies shot fabulous times. The ones that completely crumbled under the pressure were my seniors. That's the pressure. Yeah, it's self-induced pressure. Yeah. The rookies have none. Cause... They have not. They they don't have like like that sense of awareness or anything. They're like, oh, shoot this one, don't shoot that one. Okay, got yeah. it, <laughs> done. You know, <laughs> you know, whereas my seniors, you know, they're like <laughs> they couldn't slow down. They couldn't show that they couldn't. They couldn't demonstrate discipline, and so I had more more of uh, those uh, penalty targets for my seniors than any other group by far. Yeah, that reminds me of, you know, college nationals. Usually that is the slower running match because because of all those things about ego and and pressure that the older kids just can't get past, you know. Yeah. So they shoot or they miss a lot more, generally speaking. They miss a lot more and Mm-hmm. Just take a long time <laughs> to get. Yeah, to, I mean, our fastest know. kids in the sport are usually middle schoolers. Yeah, you know they've been in the program two or three years. They've acquired the skills. Um, you know they got all that fast twitch muscle fiber. You go to the Olympic Training Center, and they'll talk to you all about that. And 
But basically, once you hit 18, you're losing 1% fast twitch muscle fiber every year for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? And it's, the, it's those little middle schoolers. They play video games and, yeah. you know, they're amped up on, you know, Red Bull and <laughs> or whatever, right? And they, they're burning these stages down faster than than any of our other age groups. Yeah. So. Do they listen better to coaching? Take advice? That's a really tough one. I think that I th I think that they're oftentimes better able to implement advice. I think like honestly, like my college kids, they they comprehend it better, but they can't apply it better. Like they can understand complex equations and complex systems. And you know, we talk about shooting it like on a regular basis. And um, but like you've got to be able to take your ego out of the equation. This isn't about how fast you think you are. And if you, and if you're missing, if you're shooting seven shots on a stage, um, it, it's not the gun's fault. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, to wrap it up, what, what advice they haven't said already, what advice do you have for new coaches kind of, we're already, the team is established, but, it's mm -hmm. not they're still building yep. it yep i mean simply don't be afraid of making mistakes you just got to get out there you got to kind of jump in it's not the kind of thing you can ease into the shallow end you know um i feel really fortunate because i've had like a really broad spectrum of coaches uh one of my coaches was uh was a mexican national and he came home one day from college and all the guns were gone in the house you know, so he's got kind of a different appreciation for how the Second Amendment protects us up here that when he was a college kid in, in Mexico, you know, all the guns got taken away. So like those life lessons are really important to like share with the team. You know, another coach that I had was um, was a SWAT uh, trainer, you know, with the police department. Another one was, uh, you know, one of my best coaches was um, coached with girls soccer for 15 years. So he really understands people. He understands how to talk to people. He understands how to relate to people. He understands how skill building gets you the results that you want. Um, and so I would say like, you really want um, like a broad spectrum of coaches and everybody's going to bring something really different to it. So, um, you know, there's, there's no one thing that leads to success. You've got to have the financial resources. You've got to have the club. You've got to have good coaches. You've got to have somebody that is willing to do the paperwork. Um, you know, the paperwork part of it is uh, nobody likes doing it, but you got to get kids registered and you got to get the athlete fees paid. And I mean, there's just so many little elements that go into having a successful team that, um, that there's no magic bullet. You know, it's just you got to be able to uh, kind of cover all the bases, have somebody that understands fundraising and goes after friends of NRA grants, um, somebody else that's, you know, it's like, okay, well, we're going to nationals. Great. That means housing. That means car rentals. That means transportation. That means, you know, feeding, you know, six, eight kids for a week. I mean, you know, you got to be able to somebody that's got all of these skills and be able to bring them all together. Um, and, you know, ultimately in the end, like if, if, if you're not doing the job right, the kids will tell you because they're not having fun. I mean, this, this is supposed to be fun. If you, yeah. if the kids aren't having fun and the coaches aren't having fun, your program's not going to last very long. So you got to make sure that you're, you're always focused on making sure that, because that's what we're there. I mean, we're volunteer coaches. We're doing it for the kids. So we got to make sure that the kids are getting out of it. Um, you know, the fun that, that they want to have and, and boy, shooting sports are, are fabulous for that. And, you know, just uh, two days ago, we were playing tic-tac-toe. We were doing it with guns. And on the on the, on the the next stage over, we were playing Battleship. So you can go to, you can get all these, you know, fantastic targets. And oh, you suck my PT boat. And you're like, okay, I want to shoot your submarine. And, you know, I mean, literally we're playing like board game Battleship on paper at our at our range. And, and you know, you never know how that stuff's going to go over. So, and these kids were all about it, man. They were after it. So... And that's the kind of fun you, you, you come up with these little games that teach fundamentals and they don't even realize they're learning. 
you know, but they're having fun doing it, you yeah. know, punching holes in paper. And that's a whole lot better than, you know, some bullseye at five yards. Like, oh my God, how let's let's go watch grass grow, right? Like let's let's do this, like make this more fun. Okay, well, tic-tac-toe, play battleship, play, you know, um, I mean, there's so many good drills out there. Do the do the five by five drill, do um um I'm trying to think of what what we did like a month ago. Um, I don't know. There, there's so many good challenge targets out there, but mm -hmm. you know, and, and add some variety to it. Looking back on it, I the University of Florida was not like okay, we got some medals, big deal. But looking back on it, it was all the fun that I had that yeah. I appreciate. You know. Yep, absolutely. And we make a big deal out of after we shoot, we go eat. Like that, that's really important. That's a like an important part of it because that's when, when we're on the range, it's like, okay, the coach said to do this. Okay. Now the coach said to do this. And so we go to eat and it's like, I sit back there and I just like, okay, you guys, and you know, I listen to them. They start telling these stories and swapping tales and stuff. And, and I mean, and that, that's fun. I mean, it, shooting as a team is very much a social activity and you literally, I think it's important. You have to build that opportunity in. So they can be a social activity. So right. I think that's really important. Um, so for any coaches listening to this, um, what is your email so they can maybe bounce some ideas off you or ask you questions? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, B Perkins at sssfonline.com. Well, awesome, Bill. I appreciate your time and all that insight. That's really helpful to to the coach just start now and even coaches that are have been in the game for a while yeah don't be afraid of making mistakes like if your kids are having fun and you're running the safe program you're doing it right awesome. so cool well, thank you sir all right okay